Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the View from the Far Side series with Dennis McKenna, inspired by his new visionary blog, accessible at McKenna.academy. We are so excited to have you here. We launched a series with a very special premiere episode celebrating the experiment at La Chorrera, a 50-year retrospective. My name is Abby Navarro, and I'm truly blessed to be a part of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy family. The Academy engages in, educational, in education and research about the cultural and spiritual potential of the insoul cosmos, in which humans take our place as interdependent beings who seek to form a collaborative, symbiotic relationship with nature. Now I'd like to give you a quick rundown about crowd, Crowdcast. <laughs> For those who are new to Crowdcast, I'll let you know about this beautiful gathering space that we have here. To access the comment section, there's a chat bar at the base of the screen on mobile devices and on the bottom right on desktop. I invite you to enjoy this community space where we welcome your comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this program. I ask that you please keep the, kind, the comments kind and relevant to this event. I would love to know where you guys are tuning in from. So let's see. I'm currently in Puerto Rico. I'm really excited to be here. I've been here for a little bit. It's nice and hot. Where is everybody else coming from? Any cool places around the world? I know we have people here from all around the world. Nashville, North Carolina, the UK, Manchester. Wow, Toronto, Amsterdam. <laughs> so many places. Vancouver, Brazil. Wow, Mexico, Colombia, London. This is so amazing. Trinidad, Seattle, Chicago, England. Welcome everyone. Hawaii, Singapore. That is so amazing. Thank you all for coming. DC, Cape Town, Los Angeles. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for being present and here on this amazing event. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you for your contributions, for your time and your energy. During this event, you also have the option to easily share with your friends via social media. At the top of your screen on mobile devices and on the top right on desktop, you'll see a share button. Please spread the word so everybody can be part of this amazingness. Replays will be available immediately to the registrants and for people who are registering after, they can also see the replays. When it comes to troubleshooting, uh, we do have people all over the world working on this amazing event. So if your internet is connected to the Chrome browser, this is the optimal browser for Crowdcast. If you're having any issues streaming this video, then I would suggest switching to Chrome, refreshing your browser, and or closing any other tabs or applications. It'll be a lot better. <laughs> uh, this event is made possible by your, our generous supporters. Thank you so much. If you feel called to donate to the McKenna Academy, there is a green button at the base of your screen where you can contribute to further programs. Now let's talk about the Q&A. After today's fireside chat, which will run about 90 minutes, we will have a live Q&A with Dennis. Be sure to stick around for this opportunity to share your questions about the La Chorrera and psychedelic experience. You can submit your questions through the event at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a button labeled, ask a question. You can also upvote questions there. So be sure to chime in on topics you would like answered. Questions will be answered based on popular vote and relevance. Q and A will run about 30 minutes, or if there's a lot of good questions, maybe a little bit more. And we should, be uh, we should be concluding the event around 2 p.m. Pacific time. Well, now, the moment you all have been waiting for, Jermo, please, to welcome my co-host and today's star speaker, Dennis McKenna.
Dennis Good McKenna morning. is a renowned ethnopharmacologist focused on the study of hallucinogenic plants. He is the principal founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy and a founding member of the Hafter Research Institute. He is also a key organizer in the HOASCA project, as well as organizing the ESPD 50 conference. His work has been foundational in the scientific exploration of ayahuasca among many other realms. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And thank everyone else. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this, uh, this retrospective uh, with everyone. Uh, this is, will be a pre it is a pre-recorded interview with Graham St. John, uh, who kindly, uh, agreed to, he, to, uh, not everyone knows who he is, but he is a, uh, a cultural anthropologist and the author of, uh, Mystery School in Hyperspace, a cultural history of DMT. So, uh, Abby, do you want to introduce, give the folks a little more background on Graham? Well, I think you explained it really well. Um, okay. He's also, the only thing you didn't mention was that he's working on completing an intellectual biography of Terence McKenna. Yes, that's right. He's, and that's going to be something to see. I've been helping him out, giving him information as I as I uh, come upon it. And uh, he's a very thorough scholar, so he he does a lot of digging. And I, I think it's gonna be a very interesting biography. So uh, I guess I can say a, f uh, a little bit about today's interview. It will be about 90 minutes. And, uh, and then we'll have the Q&A afterwards, which we've said will last 30 minutes or so, but we're not bound. We can go beyond that if there are lots of good questions, and I expect there will be. So I don't know by way of preference, I think, uh, uh, or rather preface. I think most of you probably looked at the website for this event, so you're aware of the background. You're aware of the Terence and Dennis mythology, I guess you could say, around this anomalous event, uh, certainly a, a interesting, shall we say, milestone in our lives, you know, in Terence and my life, which changed our, the trajectory of our life, and in many ways changed sort of the directory of uh, the, the trajectory of uh, the way that psychedelics have found their way into our society. So I think that Without further ado, we will show this video and then come back later and we'll do the Q&A. Abby, do you have anything else you want to add or what did I leave out? I think you said everything. I would like to know if you're excited. It's been 50 years. I am, of course, think? of course I'm excited. Yeah, it's been 50 years. I am completely gobsmacked that it's been 50 years. You know, in some ways I look back and I say, Oh my God! What happened? How did we get here? <laughs> you know, but but here we are, and uh, uh, you know, as you might be ex expect, my perspective on the so-called experiment at La Chirera has changed over the years, and uh, we're going to explore that in this in this interview that we're going to show. I've also put some texts into the text boxes yesterday, just some uh, observations, because I thought that might be useful. So uh, so I guess that's it. Let's just roll it. Great. And we'll come back, back on it out the other side. Beautiful. I would suggest if you have a notebook or anything that you guys want to write down, sit back and relax. Thank you, Dennis. Welcome to our 
Listeners, I'm very pleased today to introduce Graham St. John. And the topic of our conversation is the experiment at La Chirera. It's my great pleasure to have this, this chat, this conversation with Graham St. John. He is a cultural anthropologist. He specializes in transformational events and movements. And his, he's written eight books but the one most relevant to this conversation is the Mystery School in Hyperspace, A Cultural History of DMT, which if you have not read it, you should order it immediately. It's a very interesting book about a very interesting molecule known to many of you in, uh, in the McKenna circles. And uh, he's also written other books, uh, one called Global Tribe, Technology, Spirituality, and Psy Trance in 2012. And he's the executive editor of Dance Cult, the Journal of Electronic Dance Music Culture. And he's currently working on a bi biography of Terence, my brother. And uh, I've been answering questions for that as well as I could. And I'm really looking forward to this. Graham is an excellent scholar. He goes very deep. So that's going to be a great book. Uh, his website for more information is edgecentral.net. So you can see what he's up, up to there. And uh, thank you, Graham, for coming on and being our guest for this uh, for this conversation. Well, th thanks for having me, Dennis. Th thanks for that um, wonderful introduction. And uh, yes, the uh, the the expedition, the freak expedition to La Chirera is, uh, I guess, it's a hallmark, uh, you know, freak uh, journey in into the Amazon that um, is intriguing as as well as it as much as it is uh, perplexing. And so it's a great opportunity for us to. Uh, chat about that uh 50 years down the track and uh um and and maybe excavate some uh some new meaning behind it all so this this was this was a, an ex expedition that involved uh a handful of people including you you and your brother uh to the amazon in 1971 february march 1971 so what what was wh where did this expedition this idea for this expedition arise and uh and, and what was the original motivation and purpose for it the cursory answer and the and the long answer the, the cursory answer is that uh yes it was me and terence and three of our equally fanatical friends who were uh basically immersed in the psychedelic subculture my brother in particular was uh, in the uh, experimental college at Berkeley and all of our companions were uh, people that he knew in that, in that program. I guess the question is what possessed us to throw everything aside that we were involved with? Terence was going to school, I was as well. And uh, well, at the time he, finished about two years of travel, but what possessed us to throw everything aside and go to the Amazon in 1971? Well, the reasons were complex. On one level, it was simply an ex ethnobotanical expedition. We, had, we were fascinated by DMT. Uh, as, a, as a group, we thought DMT was a more interesting psychedelic than anything any other psychedelic we'd ever encountered. And in fact, sometimes in my, ta in my talks, I say it was the most interesting thing we had encountered, not simply a drug. And we felt it was important. We had an intuition that it had something to do with uh, potentially as a portal to a hyperspatial dimension. That was the framework in which we were, uh, you know, that was the context in which we were looking at this. But it started out prosaic enough. We uh, had been experimenting with smoke DMT uh, since about 1968. It was very rare. 
at the time, but Terrence was able to find it. And we were, uh, you know, it just seemed like an order of magnitude more weird and, and interesting than LSD, which was pretty much what was available at that time. And so we thought, you know, and then there was this, this sense because the experience of DMT is very, what you might call alien-esque, very science fiction-ish and it's cast many bizarre entities and, and that sort of thing that seemed to be encountered in a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, the, the entities on the other side, if you want to put it that in this place, always seem very eager to impart information. So one of the one of the sort of disappointments of DMT or or you know, shortcomings, I don't know if it's a disappointment, but it's very short. It only lasts about 20 minutes. So by the time you just begin to get accustomed to the to the place you're in, if such a thing is even possible, but once you is it's already beginning to fade away. And so we thought that if we could find an oral act, orally active form of DMT, it would it would last longer. Basically, it's just a very naive assumption that the pharmacokinetics would be more stretched out. We could spend more time in that place, and we definitely thought of it as a place, uh, and get our sea legs and and explore it more in depth. And so when we heard about at this time no one understood the pharmacology of ayahuasca. I mean, we knew what ayahuasca was, but the importance, the fact that it was a also an orally active form of DMT was not really clear in 1971 because the importance of the DMT admixture plants had not really been investigated at that point. So when we heard, when we found this paper by Schultes called a Varola as an orally administered hallucinogen, we were fascinated because it seemed like this is what we were looking for, this, this orally active form of DMT. And we thought, well, we should go after this thing. We were, uh, and, and see what's going on. We were uh, all, immersed more or less in our cultural context. It was a time of political turmoil, much like the contemporary times. And we were disillusioned. You know, we didn't really see any political or social solutions to what was happening. So we kind of raised our sights a little bit and decided, well, let's, inter let's see if there's a way to alter the uh, nature of reality itself. <laughs> and we thought, maybe this is the key to that. So that is what led us to go to La Chirera in search of this thing, which we came to call the secret, you know, but it was a kind of tongue in cheek term. Uh, we also called ourselves the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss uh, and occasionally. And again, that, that was tongue in cheek as well. I mean, if you're going after ultimate secrets, and you may as well have a sense of humor about it. Uh, and so we tried to keep that, that perspective. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we decided, we decided to go after this, this thing. So it started out as a fairly prosaic, uh, interesting enough, but basically a fairly prosaic ethnobotanical expedition uh, to find this exotic hallucinogen. And all of this has been pretty well unpacked in the, uh, in my brother's book, True Hallucinations, and my book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. So we went there on the naive assumption that we would find this, this preparation, which the Witoto called Ukuhe, and we could explore it. We, this would be the entry into this hyperspatial portal that we kind of thought wanted to believe i guess you could say was really an access to some some other dimension you know where that dimension might be i mean i guess hyperspace is everywhere so i look at this in some ways uh our interest in finding this 
incredibly obscure psychedelic known only to a couple of tribes in the region almost as though it was a siren song in a certain way it was what called us to come to the amazon and to go to this place when we got to the amazon when we finally and and the rationale for going to la Chirera was very simple it was that that was the ancestral home of the Witoto people. It's interesting, this is maybe an aside, but it's interesting that William Burroughs had come through La Chirera decades before looking for ayahuasca. I don't know if he found it, but, but as far as I know, we were the only gringos since uh, William Burroughs passed through there to come to La Chirera because there was absolutely no reason to go. And we got there and we had been cautioned by an anthropologist that we'd encountered on the way in who told us, who number one was appalled that we showed up. I mean, this was 1971. There's no way to send an email or let people know that you're on your way. You just sort of show up in the village. And he was flabbergasted. I guess the term is gobsmacked. Uh, but he made the best of it. And, but when he, we told him that we were interested in Ukuhe, uh, he kind of freaked out. You know, he said, you, you, just, you just can't go in there and start talking about this. This is like major shamanic magic for these people. They will probably kill you if you go blabbing about this. We heard him. And we respected that. And so when we finally got to La Chirera, we encountered him in a village on another river called El Encanto. And in order to get to La Chirera, we had to go from El Encanto four days overland to this parallel river, the Rio Igara Paraná, which is where La Chirera was located. So we did this four day trek uh, through deep jungle along this trail that had been built by Witoto slaves during the rubber boom. And when we, when we finally arrived at La Chirera, what we found was that the area around this mission village had been cleared and for pasture. And they had brought in the Cebu cattle, the white humped backed uh, cattle whose dung happens to be the preferred substrate for Psilocybe cubensis, the pan-tropical psilocybin mushrooms. And when we got there, uh, you know, we settled into our, into our hut that they made available for it. We thought, well, we'll make discreet inquiries about, about uh, Ukuhe but try to avoid alarming anybody or, or uh, touching on any cultural taboos. So we'll play it cool, basically. But in the meantime, here are these mushrooms and they're everywhere. And we were very naive about that. I mean, we had almost no experience with the mushrooms. We knew what they were. We had encountered them on the way in. There's another town that we stopped at on the way in. There were a few but not enough to get a really solid dose. So we had had a very light encounter with the mushrooms and they seemed quite, uh, you know, quite friendly. So when we got to La Chirera, we kind of had a very cavalier attitude toward them. We, we thought these are just, these will be a nice distraction while we wait for Ukuhe to show up, while we wait for this secret to show up. Well, we started eating mushrooms uh, on a pretty regular basis and uh, on uh, in in substantial doses at some times. And quickly, the mushrooms made it clear that they were the secret. And they very much they very quickly rearranged our priorities. And we realized that, you know, we'd come for the perfect the perfect orally active form of DMT. And we thought it was a kuhe. Actually, it's the mushrooms, you know? And you think of the mushrooms pharmacology, it really is the active ingredient in mushroom psilocybin is converted to psilocin and psilocin is very, very close to DMT. 
on a molecular basis and the subjective experiences of high doses of mushrooms are not unlike DMT, very similar. It's, it's the same dimension, essentially, the same place. So we started consuming mushrooms and mushroom and they quickly took over the conversation in a way. And uh, uh, if you, anyone who has had experience with uh, psilocybin mushrooms in, in, at high doses and in states of darkness or isolation, they very much lend themselves to a sort of dialogue. An I-thou relationship emerges. It appears that you are in, in contact with some intelligence, whether it's the mushrooms or something channeling through the mushrooms. And we were in that place. And the mushroom began to wrap down to us the details of an experiment that he could do. And it was basically a biophysical experiment. It's say one of the phenomena that we had noticed when we were taking these high doses of mushrooms was that we could hear an audio tone inside our head. Uh, a tone is not exactly the word that describes it, but kind of a buzzing or electrical tone, which is common with DMT too. One hears things on DMT that are probably not in the external world. So we could hear this tone, but not only could we hear it, we could actually sing to it. We could try to imitate the tone. And when that happened, if, if you could lock on to the tone, it produced a, a extremely powerful uh, expulsion of sound that seemed to, well, we didn't know exactly, <laughs> but it was very interesting phenomenon. And then the mushroom is explaining that this was the electron spin resonance of the tryptamine molecules intercalating into our DNA. Well, of course, that's complete nonsense in terms of what we, the way we understand these things to, to work. You know, they, the, the molecules do not bind to DNA as far as we know, but they're, but, you know, in that way that the mushrooms have of sort of uh, oracularly proclaiming, this is, this is the way it is. We were not really able to question it. We accepted that. It, it described the protocol for doing an experiment where we thought of it as an experiment. It wasn't really an experiment because it had, it was not properly designed as an experiment with, you know, controls and all that. But the intuition was that if we were to sing this song, sing this tone to the mushrooms, while mushrooms were metabolizing in us, that we could uh, excite the DNA in both the mushrooms and ourselves into a hyper activated state that, so that it would generate a standing waveform that would actually be visible and that would be radiating or broadcasting the information in DNA in the, on, the, on the phylogenetic level. This is what we were told it, it, and, it, and 50 years on or even less than that it's like if you really reflect on this none of this makes sense you know in a certain way it's, but so it, it but when you're when you're in the middle of this experience you know we we did not really question whether it made sense it seemed to make perfect sense and we were not we were not really into uh, we didn't make any attempt to be skeptical or, or uh, uh, you know, argue with the teacher. The mushroom quickly became identified in our minds as the teacher. And whether the teacher was the mushroom itself or some alien entity that was channeling through the mushroom, uh, we didn't know. And that was like not an important detail but it explained how to carry out this experimental protocol involving making sounds based on what we could hear in our head and essentially performing a kind of uh, psychosurgery 
on ourselves to create an artifact that would be visible, that would be made of mind and matter at the same time. So a kind of psycho biological artifact that we created, that we would create out of our own bodies. And uh, even as I hear myself describing this, I'm, I'm, you know, a little flabbergasted by how just crazy this is, you know, these ideas. Yet at the time they made perfect sense. We predicted that if the experiment succeeded, certain things would happen. Uh, namely that the DNA in the mushroom would be activated to a superconducting state and it would form a, a standing waveform that, that was stable, that was visible, that was essentially an extension of ourselves or an extension of this hyperdimensional uh, hybridization between ourselves and the mushroom. So it was a biological object, but a psychic object at the same time. And that it would be visible. It would be in, in fact, the logos made visible, pure information. And we talked about uh, translinguistic matter as the, the, uh, the expression of what you could see this, this, this projection of sound would actually become visible. And there's, plenty of text uh, in the Bible and so on that talks about the, uh, the word and the word becoming visible. So this was kind of the loose framework that we were, that we were working under. What we had predicted would happen when we made this, uh, when we made this sound was that the mushroom would explode in, as it, as it uh, plunged toward uh, near, absolute zero in order to ob obtain the superconducting state. And what would be left would be a visible lenticular object that you could both see and be at the same time. And that it would respond to the imagination. It would respond to telepathic commands and could literally do anything that you could dream up for it to do. So, How's that for bananas? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's fascinating. I'd like to take a couple of steps back. Sure. And uh, I'm sure that people listening would be, want to hear some more about the context. Not only, you mentioned the, the wider political context at that time, the turn of the 70s, but um, it's also the, the personal context that you and particularly that you and uh, Terence were ex experiencing uh, immediately going into that uh, situation. So you, you'd uh, both suffered some adversities. Uh, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, th those contexts and also uh, the, the, uh, the, the other members of, uh, of the expeditions, because I understand there was some interpersonal issues that were, were of interest were, 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 were unfolded there. Uh, so perhaps you could get into that a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, there was, there was a lot about this expedition and this decision to do this, uh, to take this trip to La Chirera. Uh For my brother and I, that was very personal uh, because our mother had just died a few months earlier in October of, of uh, 1970. She had died of cancer, had been battling cancer for a long time. Uh, my brother was unable to come into the country while she was on her deathbed. So he wasn't able to see her, which was very concerning to him. He was very upset about that. So he was not able to be with my mother when she died. I was with her, but I think we both came out of that with a great deal of guilt uh, uh, about essentially being uh, selfish young men, full of our own preoccupations and our own fantasies and maybe not giving her the support that she really deserved 
in her final days. And so part of the, I think part of the subtext of the experiment at La Cherero was the thinking that we could actually change the nature of space time. We could actually change the timeline and seize the controls and perhaps even save her by going back in time. And the, and the invention that we were making would, would of course be able to travel in time. It would be able to do anything like that. So there was that, that element that we could bring about healing uh, post facto in a way. After her death, we could actually still help, you know, at least solve our own guilty consciousness about it. Now, the people that, that accompanied us, they were all friends of Terence's from the uh, Tussman program at Berkeley, the so-called experimental college. And these folks were, you know, they were interested, of course, in psychedelics as we were, but they were maybe not quite as, uh, as fanatical as we were. And as we got to La Cherera and began to move into this very peculiar conceptual space, they sort of recoiled away from it and they sort of became, a well, sort of, I shouldn't say sort of, they actually became very concerned that Terence and I were going off the rails, you know, and maybe we were. They were not convinced of the information that we were downloading, you know, and, and we were utterly convinced about it. So we were like, they, they became the non-believers and we, we just basically put them off. We just said, look, this is happening. We understand perfectly each other what we're trying to do. And we understand what the mushroom teacher is trying to teach us to do. So uh, there was, you know, as things wore on, and we attempted the experiment and the experiment did not have the predicted outcome. Instead, it, it put us both into a prolonged altered state. And uh, in my case, I became completely dissociated from reality and was taking a trip through these higher dimensions, which I was experiencing as this alternate solar system or the solar system as my narrative as I as I moved into these dimensions was telling me did not at all uh, resemble uh, our current understanding of the solar system. So I was pretty much estranged from reality at the time. And Terence's response was to be almost the exact opposite. He became hyper vigilant and he uh, became very, very focused on the environment and particularly on me because he felt, I think again, on the personal level, I think there was some feeling that, you know, he dragged his little brother to the Amazon and then driven him crazy, which is what he's been trying to do all his life. So he'd finally succeeded, but then he got a little guilty about that. So he had to, he had to, uh, he was focused on me to look after me essentially because at that point for a couple of weeks after we did the experiment, I was really three sheets to the wind. You know, I could not, uh, I was just not in touch with reality. So that was concerning, concerning to our companions, not that there was much that they could do about it. We just had to let it play out, you know, and, and that's one of the things about the experiment at La Cherera, just on a personal level that I'm uh, very grateful for the fact that, you know, what was happening to me, Terence understood, we were in, in sync, we were in communication, and he recognized the need to protect me and not not abort this process to, to let it play out. We were both operating under the assumption that something had happened. Well, something did happen, not exactly what we uh, what we had predicted, but we were working under the assumption that maybe we had succeeded and it just had not manifested quite in the way 
that we thought. So our our operating assumption is everything is fine, stay the course, just let it play out. And so we did. And uh, all of the peculiar events that unfolded after uh, the experiment at La Chirera are described in both of our books, you know, including the the UFO sighting that came some days later that Terence saw. Other aspects of the of the experiment was uh, the time wave, you know, uh, the time wave is a mathematical construction that that uh, you know took that Terence elaborated over decades actually. But the seeds of the idea were planted in his head at the experiment at La Chirera. We performed the experiment and the idea was to condense the stone, condense this object, which we began to, which we started calling the stone, like the philosopher's stone. And we figured that we performed the experiment, we'd succeeded because of apparently anomalous events that happened right after we uh, performed the experiment, but that our timing was off. And we were, the stone was going to condense, but we couldn't predict when. And that's what led to Terence constructing all of these cycles that eventually turned out to be uh, the basis of the time wave. He was trying to suss out when is this thing going to show up? When will it actually manifest? And, uh, you know, and as it turned out, it, it did not manifest then. It's never manifested, but the time wave uh, was constructed in part as a instrument to sort of nail down when this... Uh, this transcendental object at the end of time, that which we, which has sometimes been called, uh, would appear, and we knew that if it, uh, you know, if it did appear and it was what it purported to be, that would in fact be the end of time. So uh, we were, uh, you know, we were trying to end history basically, and uh, he was trying to predict when this event would would manifest and at first it was just the local cycles around well it was so many days since our mother's death that if you count it forward from the experiment at La Chirera it was his birthday on November 16th 1971 and all of these different cycles but then as he developed the time wave over time the the whole premise of the time wave was that time has an end and he wanted to put a marker down at when is this spiral, this fractal spiral of time that the I Ching postulates or that the time wave postulates, when is the singularity point? Because it was a, you know, it was a contracting spiral. I wanted to ask you about the the abrupt ending of that that experience because I know that um, you know Terence had uh, claimed in 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 uh, true hallucinations that it was La Chirera was the uh, was the center of the secrets and 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 uh, discourse like that mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to me that he he had been in because as you said he he he'd been on the lamb and this was seemed like an ideal. Um, sort of um, uh, hide out for him. He also had, uh, you know, fallen in love in that environment, which was uh, a, a bounteous with uh, mushrooms. So when you were finally pulled out, ripped out of that, it was a little little like um, uh, being, um, you know, uh, ripped ripped from the womb, you know, ripped, torn from, from paradise. So can, can you explain a little bit about what happened there towards the end. I mean, La Chirera did seem like a magical place, you know, when we got there. And a lot of it was uh, was seasonal because, you know, we just happened to show up during the rainy season, which of course was the height of when the mushrooms, the mushrooms were there. So we walked into this psychedelic paradise, 
you know, and found the secret, you know, which, I mean, we had come for the secret. We didn't know exactly what the secret was, but when we got there, it quickly became clear the mushrooms were the secret and it wasn't hard to find. All you had to do is look down and pick them and eat them. And pretty soon you were in dialogue with the secret. And so that went on. And then we, we did the experiment and I began to, you know, spin out into some uh, alternate reality. And uh, our companions became concerned. Uh, and honestly, I would have been concerned too, except I wasn't because it, that's what was happening to me. And it wasn't, I was not afraid or anything like that. I was too far beyond that to worry about it. You know, Terrence and I were working under the framework of this meme that we both understood and our pa companions did not. And our companions were saying, you know, both of you are completely nuts and you need, we need to get you out of here and we need to get you to a, you know, a psychiatric facility or something. And Terrence pushed back against that. I was not in the conversation because I was not in any conversation except with my, my hyperspatial entities at that point, but they, they were arguing that, you know, this is a disaster and, and he was saying, no, just chill out, just let it happen, let it unfold. And I'm really grateful that he took that position because it did actually, what would have been an abortive uh, interruption of this psychotic break, it was actually able to, re to heal itself, to play out. And it turned out to be a healing experience. I, I feel like I am a more whole person now because that happened, you know, because of what I learned. And I don't think I'm crazy. I mean, I have some funny ideas, you know, but I know the difference between ordinary reality and non-ordinary reality and so on. Uh, so it was very good for me. It was in some sense a shamanic initiation. Uh, and, you know, I've discussed the experiment at La Chirera in terms of, you know, is it a, was it a psychotic break? Well, certainly of, of some kind it was. Was it a shamanic initiation as well? Yeah, it seemed like it was. And there are similarities, obviously, that's been discussed in anthropology and elsewhere about the, you know, the, the, the initiation of shamans often involves a prolonged uh, essentially psychosis or altered state. The third aspect of it was that I've discussed is, was it an alien encounter? That's a harder case to make, but there were elements of it that uh, were sort of, were characteristic of your typical alien encounter, although it seems an oxymoron to talk about a typical alien encounter, but there are certain patterns to it to alien encounters that you can discern. This idea, for example, of, of answering a call, the, you know, the siren call, that was certainly there before we ever left for La Chirera. The idea that uh, information is transferred and boy, was there information being transferred, not only in how to do the experiment, but also all of this stuff about time that Terence was on the receiving end of. Was any of that information valid? I don't know, but there was a ton of it. There was lots of information. And another characteristic of alien encounters is that uh, gifts are given. You know, you receive gifts, not only information, but actual gifts. What was the gift in this case? I've come to think that the, the gift and the one thing from the experiment and our trip to La Chirera that really made a difference in the world and its impact on society is the fact that we brought the spores back with us and we figured out how to grow those critters. And, uh, and that has had an impact and our motivation in wanting to grow the mushrooms when we brought them back was well, we wanted to have access to the experiment, to the experience, obviously, to the mushrooms. 
we also wanted to share with the world our we wanted to make let other people have access to it as well if they could confirm or disconfirm that there was really some weird shit out there you know and as it spread through society we got confirmation at some point when i was uh three sheets to the wind and not really in control of myself Terence and Mike and his companions were monitoring me, making sure that I didn't hurt myself and that I didn't run off. That was the thing that I was compelled to leave our hut and go wandering among the people because I was I wanted to heal people. I felt I had the power, you know, so I wanted to go out and heal. I was charged with this energy. And at some point during the, uh, during, while all this was going on, I did get away from the, my companions and uh, I climbed the bell tower in front of the church and I started ringing the bell. And uh, that was an alarm that alarmed the whole community. I mean, the whole community, the, the community around there, the, the priests, a, a few nuns and some of the, some of the people, they were aware that we were very strange people. <laughs> there were some very strange things going on, but they didn't pay too much attention. But when I breached security and, and you know, woke up the whole mission by ringing this bell early in the morning, then our companions were like, okay, that's it. That's it. This is over. We've got to stop this. And, <laughs> Well, what do you do if you want to stop it? They wanted to call an airplane and have us airlifted out of there, but that, this isn't really an option. You know, it wasn't at the time. And that's why the, the uh, experience was able to play out because there really wasn't an option to, to leave. And, uh, but what did happen at that point was that uh, they, uh, removed me from the hut that we'd been staying in and actually took me to the to the holding pin there was a police outpost there so they put me in the holding pin essentially just a room where i could be locked away and wouldn't wander off and hurt myself i am told they told me later that i completely destroyed the room I broke up every piece of furniture in the room. There wasn't much. There was maybe a table and a chair. Tried to rip the uh, frame off the window. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that all happened. So they uh, they were really pushing to get uh, to call in an airplane to to uh, to take us out. Well, as it turns out, one was scheduled to show up. Anyway, we, we had more or less uh, arranged before we'd gone there for a person to, uh, this bush pilot to come and, uh, and pick us up. And eventually he did show up and he took us out of there. I was still completely, pretty much, I mean, each day I was getting a little closer to reality. I was slowly deflating, slowly coming back, but still very much in a place of delusion and hallucination and uh you know not really interpreting what was going or not really interpreting what was going on as it was actually going on but more or less as it fit into my fantasies about what was going on i remember we were uh, airlifted to uh laetitia the two weeks after the experiment were the most intense but it took several weeks and it was like every day was a little bit more uh, another step toward condensation, toward reconstitution of my personality. Uh, and eventually it fell back together. It came, came together. And, uh, and at that point, uh, you know, I mean, I was pretty much done with trying to do the hypercarbolation. I, 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 I had become, uh, I, I guess, I guess the enormity of what had happened and the actual danger that I might have been in sort of came home to me. 
at that time as I got more integrated into reality. At the time, I didn't, I had no concern, you know, I was not thinking about those things. But as I began to uh, get more into consensus reality, I began to realize this was actually probably a very foolhardy thing to do. And I was lucky I didn't uh, go completely insane forever. Maybe yeah. some people would disagree and say I did go completely insane forever, but I, I, you know, I mask it well, apparently. So, so that's, that was the sequelae that, uh, that happened after the experiment. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring up one, one of your uh, fellow adventurers there uh, who you both call Vanessa in uh, your book, who is someone I've spoken to uh, that's uh, uh, Sarah Hartley, who, um, who has uh, spoken to me uh, for the first time about uh, her experience for, for my book on uh, uh, my biography of Terence and um, yeah, she, she's um, told me some very interesting stuff about the, the interactions, uh, how she went in uh, as a, a close friend of Terry's and had become quite estranged uh, after that because she was involved with this tussle over you through that, um, through that whole drama where um, I think, uh, as Terence had mentioned in, in his book, that uh, you, you kept calling for the... Uh, you know, when are we going to have the uh, the media conference and so on? And uh, th then you then you uh, rang the bell tower and then right. all hell broke loose. And then she had this final sort of showdown with mm -hmm. him where she thought he was really callous. And then he said, "But where are you going to be when when the sources arrive?" You know, <laughs> and um, something along those lines. And and so. Um, but also a fascinating thing part, part about her is that uh, Sarah, of course, gone in there with uh, as your uh, sort of official uh, documenter with her with her reel to reel tape recorder and her uh, mm -hmm. cameras. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, to her, to her great uh, sadness, she she lost most of that material to mold, which is a great great travesty. Right. A few of the pictures survive. You've probably seen those pictures, but yeah, it's a pity because all that's left uh, of that, because of that, all that's left is are these notebooks, these journals, and one of which is the journal that I wrote uh, leading up to the experiment. I mean, I had a journal which I brought with me, but leading up to the experiment, all of this information was being downloaded and I was furiously trying to get it on paper, essentially to write the experimental protocol, you know, and uh, I remember even as it was almost like automatic writing, I was compelled to write these things. And this was a, this was a blueprint or a, you know, like an experimental protocol. This is how you do it. And that part has survived. And then, as you know, Graham, uh, Terence's, uh, uh, you know, Terence's writing also uh, in his journal, most of which was post luxury So what happened, maybe it's worth, worth going, going back to talk about that. What happened, I finally got my feet on the ground enough that I flew back to Boulder and I, this would be like May of 1971. I flew back there and I was, I was ready to, you know, get seriously into consensus reality. And I was, I was, I was done with all this. I wanted just to go back to school and I determined to start studying science, which I had been before, but start sort of looking more at harder sciences. And in some ways, I think that was something that I grasped onto, uh, you know, as a, as a lifeline to the consensus world. So I did that. Terence, on the other hand, uh, Terence and Kume stayed in Colombia for a while. And then uh, he, 
uh, all the time utterly convinced that we had done the experiment, it had succeeded. I mean, this is sort of like people that say, well, you know, uh, the election really was stolen. I mean, <laughs> in the in the face of all evidence, and this is kind of how this was kind of Terence's attitude that we that we had succeeded. And so he determined to go back to Berkeley, and which he did in, I think it was about June of 71, and talked to his, you know, bring the good news, essentially, to his friends, uh, many of, you know, from, from just part of the community in Berkeley that he was part of, and, and utterly convinced that they would be amazed and, oh, wow, you did this thing. That wasn't what happened. They was like, you are nuts. You are completely batshit crazy. You know, that was not the reaction that he'd expected. But they got there and then they, uh, you know, and, and during their trip to back to La Chirera the second time and then back from La Chirera, they made their way back to the States through uh, Colombia. Uh, and during this time, he was working on that manuscript, the one that you have and the one that eventually became, well, in some sense, was a precursor to the invisible landscape, which was also derived from an earlier book that we had written, which was never published in that form called Shamanic Investigations. That book was only published as a, as a typescript with uh, two or three volumes, but eventually that became the invisible landscape, which was an attempt to put some kind of a scientific framework around all of these events, you know, and doomed to failure, essentially. I mean, it took a while to, to reach the point where I had to admit most of this stuff was nonsense. You know, but it was a very seductive kind of nonsense, these ideas, which in some ways are evinced by the fact that we published the book and the book has was received with some degree of acceptance by a lot of people. So it's not like we were totally deluded and obviously we're deluded. Or if we were, other people were too. These ideas had a right. power about I'll them. Jump in and say something about um, one of the reviews that I've seen. It was a 1976 uh, review, just just a one line review of the invisible landscape uh, from the Journal of Parapsychology. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, uh, the line is: uh, the authors attempt attempted deliberately to induce in themselves a state similar to, if not identi identical, with schizophrenia. There's no personal derogation to remark that their book suggests that they succeeded. So I, I'm not sure that uh, there were there were too many um, reviews of uh, the invisible landscape. Maybe you could uh, tell me because it's such an obscure book, certainly back in the days. But there, then then it was uh, then there was a, a, a another edition in '94. This was this was a review from 1976. Yeah, yeah. No, the invisible landscape is a very peculiar volume, you know, because it does try to provide some kind of a scientific rationale for what was happening. And, and it's inherently impossible, you know, to do that. I think that a much more, you know, uh, I think a much more honest rendition of what happened was Terence's book, True Hallucinations, you know, which was basically a narrative of what went on when we went to La Chirera. And it reads like a novel. It's very much, it's not technical at all. And all of the sort of technical mumbo jumbo that we put into the, uh, the invisible landscape, it, you know, it, it didn't, I mean, it seemed implausible at the time, and as, as the years went on, it, it didn't wear well. You know, if you look at some of these concepts, they're clearly just not valid. You know, for example, the time wave itself, you know, Terence Pot and, and many of my theories that were downloaded in the experiments, my theories about drug action, and that the idea that the tryptamines intercalate into DNA and that these are the receptors for for the uh, 
for the for the tryptamine psychedelics at least and they you know i mean in 1971 nobody knew even what a serotonin receptor was we had no idea about the actual structure of these things well now we've totally elucidated this science has i should say we know the tertiary and primary structure of the serotonin receptors. We know where the psychedelic receptors are located in the brain. And, you know, the understanding of all that is very good. There has been progress. Back in 1971, nobody had a clue, you know, so the most cockamamie crazy ideas could be seriously considered. Similarly with the time wave, you know, Terence, uh, uh, constructed this mathematical object based on what he had learned during the experiment at La Chirera and elaborated it enormously. The problem with the time wave is that uh, it couldn't be disproved. That was the thing. That was my main criticism of, of the thing, that it was an entirely subjective construct. It was a mathematical construct that purported to describe the purported number one, that time had a structure and that the time wave is a way to map the ingression of novelty into the continuum. This was the postulate. To me, there, there is no real way, real way of understanding uh, the time wave from uh, so much a scientific perspective than a, you know, a poetic, uh, in a mythopoetic perspective, because uh, a deep analysis of that sees a lot of unconscious symbolism bubbling to the surface with with Terence. The, the, the whole idea of um, you know be, being um, you know conquering matter and ending history. Um, there's uh, you know he himself was inspired perhaps by Jung more than any other theorist. I suspect, and, and that is a Jungian analysis is, is uh, I think, an appropriate there. I mean, we're talking about how uh, the the time wave will uh, eventually, you know, conquer death, you know, and we'll all be uh, transported into the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's the question of, you know, was this uh, a, a, an unconscious expression of his anxiety towards his own mortality? It could have been, yes, it could have been. Of course, back then there was no inkling that that he would, uh, you know, that he would be gone by the time 2012 uh, came around. But I think it was, I think it was definitely uh, that was an element of it, anxiety about that, and the hope for essentially a better world, and and, and the you know the manifestation. Well you can't separate this really from our Catholic upbringing in a certain way. I mean, that's, that's a part of it because Catholicism, Christianity in general, but especially Catholicism is the religion of the apocalypse, you know, I mean, built into the assumptions of Christianity is that time is linear and time has an end, you know, unlike a lot of Eastern philosophies, which just talk about endless, endless cycles of, of death and rebirth, you know, in Christianity, time ends when the apocalypse comes, when the judgment day comes. So this was, uh, even though we had, you know, we weren't exactly <laughs> practicing Catholics, I mean, quite the opposite at that point, but this was built into our mindset in a certain sense, that time does have an end. And so it's the anticipation of what is that going to look like, you know, when time ends? And can you trigger it, essentially? Can you have an influence on bringing this about? And that was both, uh, you know, the, the hubris and the humility of what we were doing, you know? I mean, when we were in the process of doing the experiment and developing these ideas at La Chirera, you know, we would, we ask the entity, you know, why us? Why are we chosen to do this if this is really going to end history? You know, and the answer came back that because you didn't accept anything, you were, you didn't believe what anyone told you, you had to 
seek the truth on your own. And, uh, and of course, actually, you know, I mean, there was maybe not truth to that. We were probably fairly well immersed in our own delusion, I think. But, but that was the answer was that we didn't accept the dogma. We didn't accept what was, uh, what was postulated. We had to see for ourselves. And so that was a, a, effectively a very scientific approach, you know, to look into it. But I think the, you know, uh, I, I think that we went at this under the assumption that we were doing a scientific experiment, you know. The thing is, it was not an experiment for numerous reasons. It was not scientific. We were not scientists, but we were working under all these assumptions that perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps we were. And as Eric Davis said, I think very aptly, we, you know, this is built into the sort of McKenna myth, you know, and what we did at South America, we did not commit an act of science, we committed an act of science fiction. You know, and we actually we were so immersed in those themes that we actually integrated that into what we were doing. That that describes it more appropriately than than saying it was it was certainly not a scientific experiment. It may have been a shamanic experiment in some ways or a shamanic experience. Uh, but the memes of science fiction, which we both shared and had for many years really had an influence on the way we understood this, you know, and uh, our cognitive categories at the time were quite loose. What happened to us led Terence to, to postulate that, you know, science is utterly unable to answer any of this. This shows that science has failed in terms of understanding reality. And my attitude was, well, wait a minute, we're not scientists, so we can't really say that. We have to become scientists. We have to learn to do science and then do it before we can really evaluate what was going on. And once we can see it from within the perspective of science, we can see the, the gaps and, and the flaws in this, in the assumptions that we were operating under, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's sort of like you you can, you know, you, you can see a cool science fiction movie, something going on, and all of these terms are used, and they all sound very scientific and very cool, but are they, in the end, they're gibberish. And I think that that may be what we have to say about the experiment at La Chirera. But with the one thing, the one thing that really made a difference was the fact that uh, we brought the spores back. You know, nothing supernatural or, um, you know, paranormal about any of that. We brought the spores back. We learned how to grow them. Uh, we shared that knowledge widely by publishing the Magic Mushroom Growers Guide. And that, over 50 years, has had an impact. You know, I think the last 50 years would have been quite different if uh, people did not have easy access to psilocybin mushrooms. And now, you know, it's taken this long, but finally mushrooms are being recognized for, if not the, the key to the end of the world, certainly as interesting medicines that might be useful for certainly for uh, treating mental illness, such as depression and trauma and this sort of thing, but basically as a tool to uh, explore consciousness. I think that psilocybin is the perfect molecular probe to explore the outer fringes of consciousness. And that's been the lasting, that's been the lasting contribution, I think. Uh, not that other people had, didn't figure out how to grow mushrooms. They were working on it too at the time, but we were the ones that published the book that made it possible for any uh, intelligent and reasonably uh, persistent 10th grader to do this uh, in their basement. And many did, and that changed the world. That changed society. 
and it still is, you know, finally the world is waking up to uh, the potential of psychedelics for not only healing, but also to really understand uh, human consciousness and, and the place of human consciousness in the cosmos. So it wasn't entirely a waste of time. Well, I think that your uh, excavations here of uh, an expedition that was sort of uh, many, many things at once uh, was millenarian, it was uh, utopian, al alchemical, shamanic, scientific, poetic, redemptive, uh, and, and ultimately a sort of a rite of passage, but with a very pragmatic outcome, as you say, um, you, uh, you, you sort of democratized uh, 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 psilocybin for the world, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a great outcome. And in some ways, you know, it did have this impact. Uh, it is having this impact on society. And, and that's the way, if you think about it, that's the way it had to happen. It wasn't that everything changed after we did the experiment at La Chirera, but it's taken 50 years for those changes to, to uh, you know, to become manifest. So in that sense, we were right, you know, uh, in, in the sense that this was a transformative discovery, and, but it's taken a while for the rest of the world to wake up to it. And uh, hopefully it will lead to a better world. I'm very thankful for you to have uh, excavated all of that. And uh, certainly some of your, your answers are helpful for my, my book project, which is still ongoing. So uh, it, it's, it's been great. I'm looking forward to that, Graham. I think it's going to be a great, a great project. And I really appreciate your coming on and discussing this. And uh, when you get your, when you get the biography written of Terence, we'll have to revisit that and, uh, and unpack that. Uh, based on your previous writing, I think that's going to be a fantastic book. So I'm really happy you're you've taken it on. I know it's uh, a lot of work and it's driven you crazy in a lot of ways, but you're a very persistent scholar and that's what it takes. More, more than faintly a ridiculous task, uh, a ludicrous task. And uh, that um, no, no one, you know, apart from your, your book, which has uh, certainly been a useful resource uh, as your, your own memoir and your life with Terence, uh, there hasn't been uh, an exclusive biography probably for a, very, for a lot of good reasons, as I've discovered. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yet it, it's, uh, it, it, is, it needs to be done and uh, I have a little bit of time on my hands to do so. And so uh, I've certainly been locked down over the last year in my own personal lockdown. Uh, and uh, we'll continue on with that, that project this year. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully that'll be finished by the end of the year. Yeah, it, it definitely needs to be done. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think it'll, I think it'll be interesting and uh, fits right in with all this. So lots of interest right now in, in, you know, sort of the cultural history of, of these psychedelics and particularly psilocybin. And we could go on for a long time here and get into that but I think this is a good comfortable place to to close out so thank you thank you so much I really appreciate it that's been, been, been an honor uh Dennis and uh I'll uh I'll, I'll catch you down the track thanks for, oh, thanks for having me all right thanks very much I think the significance of our trip to La Chirera was that we encountered the mushrooms, we collected the spores and we brought them back and we learned how to cultivate the mushrooms. And then we made that rather simple technique available by publishing a book about it. And that made it possible for lots of people to cultivate mushrooms, but it also brought the mushrooms into our culture. You know, as a result of that, the mushrooms have been one of the more easily accessible psychedelics, uh, one of the better ones. It's, it's you know, it's non-toxic. It's, it's 
relatively safe compared to many others. So, so it, it, I guess what I'm saying is that mushrooms have been part of the cultural conversation about psychedelics ever since that time or ever since we shared with the world the technique of how to grow it. So they have been around, they have been part of uh, society and have come to be accepted and, and uh, you know and, and the juncture with that we've that we've reached now is that you know their value as medicines is has been accepted as being recognized i feel like you know we were gifted some very peculiar ideas but on the practical level what came out of that was we collected the spores and we physical laws were necessary and that has impacted society uh you know greatly i think not not that we were the only ones to bring mushrooms to develop methods to control mushroom to to cultivate mushrooms uh but we were among the first if not the first to put out there a very simple technique that any intelligent 10th grader could figure out. And many intelligent 10th graders and above did in fact figure it out. I mean, the growing mushrooms using the Olsenaric technique is a lot like doing a science project, you know? So it's the perfect thing for nerds, you know, which I was at the time. And, uh, uh, and Terence said once, he said several times, and I'm, I'm fond of quoting him, he said, we're in a symbiotic relationship with something that has disguised itself as an alien invasion, so as not to alarm us. And I think that's basically true. You know, I mean, the mushrooms have formed this symbiosis with humanity and uh, you know it's always had it but it didn't go global until after mushrooms were widely available so to the extent that the experiment at la Chira facilitated that and led to that it was significant we've always been co-evolving with these with these things for tens of thousands of years and quite possibly for millions of years you know there's reason to believe that mushrooms may have played a role in the evolution of, of early hominids as back as far as two million years ago. And some of this was the theme of Terence's book, Food of the Gods. And when that book came out, it was, uh, of course, dismissed and denounced and ridiculed. But actually, it was published in 1992. So now almost 30 years later, there's actually a new uh, a reprint being released. And if you take another look at the proposition now that mushrooms may have influenced the emergence of consciousness in, in hominids, in, even before there were actually humans, you know, before Homo sapiens, the precursors to Homo sapiens may have been influenced by mushrooms. So, so it's important to remember that, I mean, I guess the point I'm making here is that yes, mushrooms are medicine. They are much more than medicine. You know, uh, that's one aspect of what they do, but they are co-evolutionary partners with us. They're symbiotic partners with us. The human species is that they are, uh, they're stimulating the evolution of consciousness and the expansion of consciousness and maybe pointing the way towards some future of for our species and maybe that has to do with uh, extraterrestrial migration or who knows who really knows how the future is going to play out but you know that idea that our destiny is in the stars, you know, is a persistent meme in when we think about human evolution, like this is where we're headed. This is our destiny. You know, Earth is the incubator 
of this species that will not remain on Earth. And maybe in, in the mushroom experiences, you get an intuition, an intimation that that is the arc of this evolutionary uh, um, adventure that we are sharing with the mushrooms. We don't know what the end game of this relationship, this co-evolutionary odyssey with psychedelics. Uh, we don't know how it's going to end. What we do know is that this is a critical juncture. This is at this moment in our evolution, when we're looking at a situation where, you know, we hold within our hands as a species, the ability to completely destroy the planet, to make it uninhabitable for life. Or we, f we also hold the power to make it a paradise. And we have, we are driven by this dream that our destiny is in the stars. Who knows? Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't, but it's a good dream. How unlikely our situation is that, you know, on this one minor planet, on a minor arm of the galaxy, and, you know, a, a solar system about which there's nothing remarkable except that there is this this species of, of primates that are quite anomalous, we think. I mean, we don't know because we have nothing to compare it to, but we think we're pretty special. <laughs> and, uh, and it's because of our consciousness and our imagination. I, I guess that's the, that's the main, you know, if mushrooms have given us a gift as a species, they have taught us how to have an imagination, you know, in a certain way, how to dream. And that is what drives consciousness and evolution forward. The mushrooms, not necessarily Terence and Dennis's excellent adventure with mushrooms, other than that we helped bring it to the world and spread it around and now many people have had these experiences and confirm that they are indeed very strange, <laughs> you know, and seemingly meaningful, seemingly meaningful. Welcome back. Hello. Yes, we've been through the abyss and we're now on the other side. So, uh, how are you feeling, Astrid? Uh, I feel good. I'm uh, trying to follow the texts here and not having a, not making a very good job of that. They're coming too fast, but I appreciate the many comments that are coming in, and uh, looks really like we have fast. about fifty questions. So. Uh, I guess, uh, do we want to take a break or do we just go into the Q&A? What would you like to do? How would you like to uh, organize that? Uh, we can start with the Q&A. I would like to give you a special thanks. Wow, I'm so grateful to be a part of this amazing experience because I didn't know a lot of this and I am um, I have cultivated mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. So this is like, wow, I'm going all the way to the, to the core, to the root of, um, of this beautiful journey that I've had. So I'm so grateful, Dennis. Thank you so much because you also mentioned it, it might not just have been Terrence and Dennis who went out and uh, brought this back, but in, when it comes down to roots, it's never like one 
one root. It starts with one and then it opens up to be this beautiful, magnificent tree. And I feel like this is such a blessing to be that a blessing from the mushrooms because they're these amazing beings um, to connect me to to source. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's all we can hope for, right? So, uh, so yeah. I guess what we'll do is go into the Q and A now. Uh, we will see how the questions go. I see there are many. Uh, so they we don't are. Necess- There's 51 questions. Right. We so don't necessarily to have to. Go. We don't necessarily yeah. have to stop at 30 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. And then you'll do your closing remarks, and I'll I'll do mine and give people the rest of their day to uh, mull all Beautiful. this over. <laughs> Perfect, so let's get to these questions. Hmm. Wow, so many. If you guys want to go into the ask a question and vote for which question you would like asked, we can start to choose the most popular ones. So one question, Dennis, is how do you envision the continued decriminalization decriminalization and even legalization of psychedelic substances? Well, how do I view it? Uh, <laughs> I'm in favor of it, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, and I think this is a very good sign. I think it's a sign that our culture maybe is uh, maturing a little bit in its relationship to these substances, you know, which, uh, should never have been criminalized or prohibited. It's not our purview as a species to declare another species does not have the right to exist on the planet. So I'm very encouraged by the decriminalization movements because I think that that pathway to integrating mushrooms and other psychedelics into medicine uh, at first and society, uh, that's the way forward for this to happen. And I look forward to the day when, you know, we are past the decriminalization movement, when these things are not prohibited, then I think there will be uh, opportunities for various centers to form that offer psychedelic experiences in, you know, that are not operating underground, that are operating with, reasonable uh, standards, hopefully, and uh, people should have access to these experiences. I mean, I think this is a very important part of the human experience. So it should not be denied to people. It should be available to people, but in the right context. They're not without their dangers. That They should be approached thoughtfully and respectfully. And I think you know, the decriminalization movement will open the way to that, to bring it to a wider world in a way that will benefit many people. Moving to these psychedelic medicines, how can we proceed forward to optimize the healing potential for the world in a culturally and ecologically way? Well, uh, I think we just have to uh, proceed. Uh, what I would what I would hope is that uh, mushrooms and, and other what you might call traditional psychedelics that have been used by indigenous people that should be acknowledged and that that connection should be preserved. What I would like to see is uh, there are there are different. I guess, pros and cons against people going, for instance, to South America to seek ayahuasca. Uh, They are usually sincere people who are really looking for, they're not looking for thrills, they're looking for answers, they're looking for meaningful experiences. But then the, the tourism phenomenon puts pressure on these cultures. You know, in some ways there are benefits, in other ways, not so much, you know, there can be adverse influence on these cultures. So what I would like to see, and the criminalization movement will lead to this, is a context where 
we don't need to go to South America or Mexico or wherever to have these experiences. We can find them right here. And that's going to be uh, advanced. That's going to be a net advance. And I, I think that the, uh, you know, in, in that social context, uh, you also preserve the benefits to, to society uh, and the community. These centers operate. It's not just for the people that are going there to have the experiences and, and you know, in a safe place, but it's also how it impacts the community. And uh, uh, if these centers can operate fully in the open, uh, then that will that will benefit the community because you know their their effects does not end with the individual. It extends to the family, the society, the larger community, ultimately to the species. I completely agree. All right, next question: Where did you get your ideas about alchemy and the philosopher's stone? Well, that one's easy. Uh, basically, uh, Terence and I were both uh, very immersed in Jungian psychology at that time. During the 60s, we discovered C.G. Jung, and he wrote, uh, I mean, we, we read many alchemical works or related alchemical works. Terence, much more immersed in this than I was, but the, the, uh, the key uh, book by Jung that uh, was very influential was called Psychology and Alchemy. And uh, anyone who hasn't read it should look into it. Terence once told me back when I was a youngster and before I ever took a psychedelic, and at that time we were talking about LSD, he said, before you take LSD, read Psychology and Alchemy. And I was like, what, why should I do that? Well. And of course, I ignored that advice. I still got plenty out of my initial LSD experience. However, after I had taken it, I understood why he said that. The psychology and alchemy is a good prism or lens to look at what comes up in these kinds of experiences, you know, because this is all related to archetypes, right? And psychology and alchemy in some ways is a science of archetypes, although they don't use that language. So it was an influential book and remains so. So uh, I recommend it and anything that Jung wrote is, is quite relevant to this, uh, you know, as well as uh, the other author that was influential for us was Mircea Eliade, who wrote uh, Shamanism of the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy, uh, along with other uh, landmark books. So uh, Jung was a, a big influence. And uh, again, this was something that Terence discovered and shared with me. And then we both really uh, read pretty deeply into Jungian psychology. And that provided some of the framework for what we were doing. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, let's see. Hmm. What question? What was the ultimate fate of the silver key that you mentioned finding or producing during the expedition? Was it seen after returning or lost in the transit? Any thoughts on its appearance beyond what has been discussed in previous publications? Yes, I have no idea what happened to the silver key after that event and frankly i have no idea how i happen to have the silver key and produce it at just that moment if there was anything anomalous or paranormal about what was going on with us maybe that was it but i mean i i don't want to think that i i i don't think i just manifested it out of nothing you know, but for some reason, I had it. And I was able to produce it at a critical moment and completely blow Terence's mind, uh, as well as my own. You know, where did this come from? I can't tell you what happened to the silver key. I can tell you what happened to the box that it that it was the key to, which was a carved wooden box that we inherited from our grandfather, and I kept it in. 
uh, in my storage container for a long time. And uh, eventually, I think I mailed it someplace, or for some reason, the box became completely smashed. <laughs> so we don't have the box, and I don't know where the key is. Sorry. <laughs> Beautiful. How can we proceed forward to optimize the healing potential for the world in a culturally and ethical? Oh, sorry. I think I already read that one. Hmm. Let's so the see. what is the question? Let me find a new one. So many. Hmm. I'm curious about what ideas about alchemy were in the atmosphere at the time. Well, if you mean when we were doing the experiment, uh, yeah, the themes of alchemy were were pretty much the framework that we were carrying out this experiment in. You know, uh, if there was any kind of a conceptual uh, vessel for what we were trying to do, it was the uh, the stages of the alchemical process involved in the the condensation of the stone of fixing the stone whatever that energy was into matter there depending on who you read and so on there are different stages of the alchemical process but the one that we were focused on was this idea that you could essentially take this translinguistic matter this hyperdimensional quasi psychic quasi material object and fix it into something material, in this case, into the body of a mushroom. And, uh, uh, you know, that was the framework that the experiment at La Chirera was really all about our attempts to condense the stone, to nail it down into a visible form that was both part of us that we experienced and was also external. That was the thing. As I've said many times, you could both see it and be it at the same time. And it was a, a transcendental object that was partly biological, partly technological, and that responded to thought. So you could, it would do anything you could imagine. This was the, and this was why it was the ultimate artifact, <laughs> you know, because it, it made all other artifacts obsolete, at least in the concept. So uh, uh, yes, alchemy and then the I Ching, which later became the framework for the time wave. But in the experiment itself, the I Ching was not so prominent. It was really the idea that we were carrying out an alchemical transformation. That is what guided us in the steps of the, of the, uh, you know, of, of the experiment, uh, that was the idea. You know, and, and it's important to recognize that all of this was sort of being downloaded to us in real time. It's not like we, we've done our best to map this out, but then in the actual performance, you know, all of that sort of got swept aside. But that was the relevance of alchemy here in That's the so experiment. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you please try and imitate the sound buzzing that you would hear? Or would you be able to recommend a song or recording that resonates with this? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to repeat the sound. Uh, I don't want to destabilize the space-time continuum. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we tried it before and it didn't work. But what if it worked this time? And then we'd all have problems. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna repeat the sound. Sorry, I don't know of any recording of it. You'll have to scour YouTube. Uh, but I, I, uh, I, 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 after I, we did the experiment and had the outcome of, that it had, I, I told myself, nope, I'm not gonna go back. I, interestingly, Terence, after the experiment at La Chirera, on a number of occasions in our later visit to South America in 1981, which he was 
part of my ethnobotanical expedition, he wanted to try to repeat the experiment, you know, and I pushed back against that. I, for one thing, I was, I didn't want it. I didn't want to repeat it. And, and for the other thing, by the very nature of the, of the event, it couldn't be replicated. You can't repeat that kind of a, an event. And, and ironically, that's what the time wave is really all about. It maps the uniqueness of events, but it, but it also shows the resonances with other events on different time scales. But no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to repeat it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, different psilocybin mushrooms seem to have different personalities. Do you believe the different strains are connected to specific beings with specific purposes with unique personalities? Assu assuming the psychoactive compound in the different strains is always psilocybin, what might account for this? Oh boy, that's a deep and complicated question. I, I think it's true that uh, different species of mushrooms seem to have slightly different personalities or different personalities. I think that different natural psychedelics have different personalities. The personality, quote unquote, of ayahuasca is very different than the personality of, of mushrooms. And that in turn is different than the personality of say, uh, peyote. A, a lot of these medicines do seem to have, you know, essentially a personality or, you know, some sort of anthropomorphic aspect to it. But it's important to recognize it, you know, do they really have this? Are they really entities separate from us? Or are they an aspect of ourselves that we're projecting out there and that is then reflecting back on us? We're interacting with a part of ourself as though it wasn't part of ourselves, as though it was some independent entity. And I think we can't answer that question. You know, I, I mean, we it's a case if we don't have enough data. I mean, the, the sort of reductionist neuroscientist's view would be that you know, these entities are not real. They're something that our brains create. And then we interact with them as though they were not a part of ourselves. That's the sort of most, uh, I guess, simplistic explanation. It doesn't provide a full explanation. I don't know. You know, I think that I think the jury's still out. One of the questions that come up as far as the reality of these entities is how can you prove it? How can you query this entity? And Terence used to say in his, you know, or told me at least that in his deep mushroom experiences, he would try to get it to tell him something he couldn't possibly know. And then that would sufficiently satisfy him <coughs> that it wasn't coming from him. But it's very tricky because how do you know what you can't possibly know? You know, so it's it's hard to nail this down. It's a great answer. And speaking of Terence, Dennis, I seem to recall that Terence promised to try and communicate you from the other side. Has he managed to pull it off yet? Uh, as far as I know, he hasn't. <laughs> uh, the only thing I can... <laughs> I can point to are some some interesting dreams in which he was very present and you know assured me that he was fine that everything was fine and that was reassuring but those were dreams you know so uh, <coughs> I haven't <coughs> excuse me I haven't seen any uh, anomalous or <clears throat> excuse me, paranormal or unexplainable phenomena uh, that I could relate to Terence's, Terence's continued presence in the world. You know, I mean, it, it's almost like it's not necessary because he's very much still present in the world. I mean, all you have to do is uh, go on YouTube and realize, you know, in, in some ways the spirit of Terence haunts, the, haunts YouTube. And he's he's managed to achieve this 
weird kind of digital immortality. He's very much uh, in the conversation still 20 years after he passed on. But I have not gotten any uh, overt, no overt events that I could say, you know, this is Terence knocking on the door or whatever. But I have had, as I say, vivid dreams about him and, and the two of us together and that kind of thing. Am I here? Yeah, oh, there, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that to me. I, <laughs> I feel lost. <laughs> okay. At the travel. <laughs> I think there's a bit of a lag. Right. But we're doing really well. So on to the next question. You ready? Bring it on. All right. Could you speak on the connection between the mushrooms and language? Have there been any breakthroughs in this area? Are there any new scientific line of inquiry here? Uh, there haven't been any formal inquiries as, uh, or, you know, investigations of mushrooms and language. But I think, uh, you know, it, it's very much part of the the whole uh, stone date hypothesis that mushrooms, if they did play a role in the evolution of hominids back millions of years ago, it may have to do with the fact that they taught us how to have an imagination. And language is intimately associated with meaningful symbols, which may, may be internalized and visual input and, and auditory input. and and, you know, I've talked many times about how synesthesia, which is the experiencing of one kind of sensory modality in terms of another, for example, uh, seeing sounds and that sort of thing. Synesthetic experiences are very much possible, very common in the psychedelic experience. And when you have that synesthetic experience linked to uh, I guess you could call them memes or concept constellations that are deeply meaning meaningful. That's where you find the basis of language, the ability to signify something external and name it. And uh, in that sense, uh, I think that mushrooms were and, and still are to a certain extent cognitive learning tools. Uh, teaching us uh, how to acquire language. And of course, much of our neural architecture in, in Homo sapiens, at least, or in advanced hominids is devoted to the generation and the comprehension of language. This is perhaps not accidental. You know, somehow we, our brains evolve through epigenetics or other mechanisms to really, uh, you know, create these structures that are capable of generating language. So I think that mushrooms may have played a catalytic role on the coevolutionary level to uh, impart this ability. And of course, everything else comes from that. Culture runs on language. And, uh, you know, so this may be an inherent uh, skill that we learned that mushrooms facilitated that process. I would like to see some studies about uh, using psilocybin, for example, with conditions like uh, dyslexia, which I think I have a feeling that we would find that they could be very therapeutic for people with dyslexia, uh, just as they have been shown for people with stuttering. Uh, you know, because they help you put thoughts together, basically, and that's that's an important thing that they that they can do. I am an I am a chemist specializing in synth in synthesis of psychedelic compounds, 
and I was wondering what is your opinion on synthetic versus natural hallucinogens? I don't really have an opinion. I, I think there's a place for both. I think that, uh, uh, you know, even synthetic you, psychedelics, as I'm off, as I often say, are not outside of nature. You know, nothing is outside of nature. Even synthetic psychedelics are made by all natural organic chemists, right? So, so they're a natural product in, in themselves. I don't see any inherent superiority in uh, natural psychedelics versus synthetic psychedelics, other than maybe the cultural associations that they have. Uh, but there is a place for synthetics uh, I'm glad that there are <clears throat> synthetic chemists uh, that are exploring sort of the molecular uh, cartography of the psychedelic experience, as Sasha Shulgin did for many years, invented many compounds, and tested them all carefully on himself and kept good notes. So, uh, you know, go chemistry. I'm all, I'm all for chemistry. But I think uh, I think perhaps we should not we should be careful not to lose the connection to these natural psychedelics like mushrooms and ayahuasca, and also to honor the the indigenous connections that these things have, which you don't find in in synthetic psychedelics. Such a beautiful connect with these medicines. Mm, do you have a favorite mushroom species? Cubensis is the most common, but are but there are a variety with much more psilocybin content. Right. Uh, yeah, psilocybin, psilocybin cubensis is the most common because it's the most easily cultivated. Some of the other uh, species native to Pacific Northwest, like uh, Psilocybe baocystis, Psilocybe cyanescens, are more potent, uh, maybe about twice as potent. I don't think potency makes that much difference because, it, you know, you can always eat more. I mean, if, if you don't have a sufficient dose, the, the mushrooms are not toxic, so you can just eat enough that you reach the level that you want. Uh, I personally have not experimented with many species. I've experimented with cyanescence and baocystis and cubensis and, well, you know, they all deliver the goods. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, preference, I think. Thank you guys for your patience with this wonderful internet that we have. I'm so grateful internet even exists. So thank you for hanging in there with this lag and these technical things. Terrence sometimes spoke on the significance of the geek mystery religions. What are the thought? What are your thoughts on Brian Urescu and his research on ergot as a possible ingredient in the Eleusinian mysteries? Well, funny you should mention that because uh, I've, I don't know if the letters are reversed. It looks like they are. I've been read, I have read Brian's book. I'm very impressed with his scholarship. And uh, we're actually, the next McKenna Academy podcast is going to be a, uh, an interview with uh, Dr. Maru Rescu about this book. I think he's nailed it down. I think I think that the Road to Eleusis was an important uh, sort of initial book about this, but then the scholarship that Brian has put together in this book shows that, you know, that these psychedelic mystery religions did exist in various parts in Italy and Spain, as well as Greek Greece. Uh, it was not just Eleusis, it was also the cults of Dionysus were also ecstatic psychedelic mystery religions. And these things were the precursors of Christianity. So early Christianity, the, the Eucharist in early Christianity before the church came over, came, took it over formally and made it all 
politically correct, but the early Christian Eucharists were probably similar brews to these fermented beverages that were used in the Eleusinian mysteries and also in the in the Dionysian mysteries. So when Brian and I have an interview, we're going to unpack all this, and that will be our next podcast. I can't tell you exactly when, but probably later in this month, we're we're going to do that. So uh, stay tuned. So juicy. Uh, and speaking of juicy, there's this juicy question that I'm going to ask. A juicy Do you question. To make the use of plants, or have you gotten that message? <laughs> Or have you gotten the message and hang up the phone, so to speak, and hung up? So could you repeat the, the question? Yes. Um, I don't see you. Is, is it everything all right on your side with your camera? Yeah, I'm all, I, everything's fine. I can see you. And can you see me? Hmm. Let's go on. And I can see myself. And you're then the mechanic. Well, let's see what's happening. Let me ask this question. Do you continue to make. Ooh. You ready? Yes. <laughs> Do you continue to make the use of plants? Or have you gotten the message and hung up the phone, so to speak? Well, I've gotten the message, you know, but I have not hung up the phone entirely. Actually, I haven't hung it up at all. I still think that uh, we, I mean, I've been taking psychedelics for longer than 50 years. I'm still learning, you know. I don't know if I will ever reach a place where I hang up the phone. You know, if, if I hang up, if I reach that point, it will be because for health reasons or whatever, I can't keep taking psychedelics. But as far as reaching a point where I say, yep, I've learned everything there is to know, uh, I can hung up, hang up the phone. I don't think one reaches that point, you know. I mean, I think that psychedelics will, as long as one keeps a relationship they will continue to surprise us and they will continue to give us food for thought, essentially. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not a person who says that, you know, I mean, they're not an answering machine. You know, you should, you should uh, keep engaged. If, if you do learn from these things, whether they're real entities or some part of yourself that they open up, uh, why would you abandon that relationship? So uh, I haven't, hung up the phone and don't really intend to until I'm forced to. And have you ever returned or would you return to La Chorrera? I have never returned there. Uh, I have had thoughts about going back there. Uh, but on some level, I think, what's the point? You know, there really is no point because it was a unique place in space and time, you know, and uh, I could go back to La Chirera if I wanted to, but I think I would be disappointed. I think there would not be much there. Of course, it depends on, I guess, what season <laughs> that you come. If it's the rainy season, you know, the pastors will be there. Who knows what's happened to that place in the last 50 years? I know that for part of the time, it, at least in the 80s and 90s, it became quite a nexus for, uh, for cocaine transport, cocaine production and transport. So, you know, when we had thought about going back in 1981, we were warned that you know, the, uh, the narco traficantes had pretty much taken it over and it was not a good place to go. So I probably won't go back to La Chirera. I don't see much reason to do that. You know, if someone makes a documentary or whatever and wants to fly me in there and fly me out, I might consider that. But 
no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to repeat the uh, the Heart of Darkness adventure. I'm I'm old, people. I'm too old for that now. <laughs> I mean, I was a young man at the time. I was 20 years old. I didn't know what I was doing, as most young men 20 years old, if, as is the case with most young men 20 years old. That's why. You know, it's the benefit of ignorance in a way. Not knowing what you can't do, then you don't recognize your own limits. So you go ahead and do it. And that's where it becomes interesting. But, you know, I'm much more, shall we say, down to earth right now. And, yeah, so I, I don't see any reason to go back. Beautiful. Well, that is the end of our Q&A. Thank you so much, Dennis, for sharing all that amazing information. So many gems. I'm so grateful. Is there your, any last remarks you would like to share? Well, yes, I'd like to share. I'd like to thank everyone who, who came to this event, and I'd like to thank them for the excellent questions. And, uh, you know, and, and there are a bunch of things, much of people that need to be thanked for this, starting with you, Abby, for being such a wonderful moderator for this, and the whole McKenna Academy team, this, uh, the video that we essentially, uh, I'm mm -hmm. not a person who says that, you know, I mean, they're not an answering machine, you know, you should, you should, uh, keep engaged if if you do learn from these things whether they're real entities or some part of yourself that they open up uh why would you abandon that relationship so uh i, I haven't hung up the phone and don't really intend to until i'm forced to and have you ever returned or would you return to la chorrera i have never returned there uh, I have had thoughts about going back there. Uh, but on some level, I think, what's the point? You know, there really is no point because it was a unique place in space and time, you know, and uh, I could go back to La Chirera if I wanted to, but I think I would be disappointed. I think there would not be much there of course, it depends on, I guess, what season <laughs> that you come. If it's the rainy season, you know, the pastors will be there. Who knows what's happened to that place in the last 50 years? I know that for part of the time, it, at least in the 80s and 90s, it became quite a nexus for, uh, for cocaine transport, cocaine production and transport. So, you know, when we had thought about going back in 1981, we were warned that, you know, the uh, the narco traficantes had pretty much taken it over and it was not a good place to go. So I probably won't go back to La Chirera. I don't see much reason to do that. You know, if someone makes a documentary or whatever and wants to fly me in there and fly me out, I might consider that. But no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to repeat the... Uh, the heart of darkness adventure. I'm I'm old, people. I'm too old for that now. <laughs> I mean, I was a young man at the time. I was 20 years old. I didn't know what I was doing, as most young men 20 years old, if, as is the case with most young men 20 years old. That's why, you know, it's the benefit of ignorance, in a way, not knowing what you can't do then you don't recognize your own limits. So you go ahead and do it. And that's where it becomes interesting. But, you know, I'm much more, shall we say, down to earth right now. And yeah, so I, I don't see any reason to go back. Beautiful. Well, that is the end of our Q&A. Thank you so much, Dennis, for sharing all that amazing information. So many gems. I'm so grateful. Is there your, any last remarks you would like to share? Well, yes, I'd like to share. I'd like to thank everyone who, who came 
to this event and I'd like to thank them for the excellent questions. And, uh, you know, and, and there are a bunch of things, much of people that need to be thanked for this, starting with you, Abby, for being such a wonderful moderator for this and the whole McKenna Academy team, this, uh, the video that we did and, and this event is staged, it's produced. So this is a reflection of a lot of creative talent. And I'm very grateful to be working with this Academy team. I mean, you guys are, I mean, I guess awesome is an overworked word, but I think it applies in this case. You know, you just did a fantastic job. I want to thank everyone who helped promote this on their social media. That's really important to get the word out. That's why we have such a robust attendance. And of course, the real stars of this show are the mushrooms themselves and the indigenous people that have been the stewards of this wisdom for so long yes. that have maintained this relationship since, you know, since our prehistoric past, who knows how long we've had this relationship. But if it weren't for these cultures that have kept this knowledge over thousands of years under conditions of great adversity, they would not, we would not be able to share this knowledge as we try to integrate it into our 21st century culture and try to find our way to a, a better world. And the mushrooms are here to help us achieve that wisdom, achieve that insight and essentially in some ways act on the lessons that we learn uh, from the mushroom. So, so that's all important to show gratitude. We're very blessed. The very fact that we're all participating in this and engaging in this shows how blessed we are and we need to be grateful for that. And I wanted to say also, as you know, as we've not failed to say, to repeat uh, many times, if you want to support the Academy and its good works, uh, we very much appreciate your support. We appreciate the people that uh, in, in a lot of instances paid a little, in some places, cases quite a lot more than our asking price for these podcasts. But you can also make a donation. We have other projects going on. We officially received our uh, registration a couple of weeks ago. So we're now a 501c3 nonprofit registered with the IRS. So if you're an American, you can get you can get uh, donations. You can you can get a tax deduction for your donation, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, uh, you know your support. And uh, uh, when and just stay tuned. Sign up. Sign up to our website and stay tuned for our upcoming event. Of course, COVID has changed our development trajectory as well. The academy originally wanted to do many more physical conferences and retreats and so on. We can't do that now, so we're trying to do these virtual conferences. The next one, as I mentioned, will be with uh, Brian Morescu on the immortality key. And then a little later this spring, we're planning a mini symposium on the uh, stoned ape hypothesis. And it will have Brian and Paul Stamets and some other uh, luminaries. And it should be a very interesting uh, afternoon's worth of conversation as we unpack the stoned ape hypothesis and look at it from the perspective of 20 years after it was written. This is to, this is to acknowledge and recognize that uh, the UK Penguin Books UK has reprinted the food of the gods. So uh, it's partly to bring people's attention to that. And that will be coming up. So again, I just thank you very much for your support. Stay in touch through our newsletter and uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Have a, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dennis. Have a beautiful day.
And thank you to everyone who made donations. Your donations help other people who don't have the funds be part of this amazing experience. Thank you to the amazing magical people that are in the background that are doing all the hard work back there to make this um, live stream possible. I'm so grateful. I hope you all have an amazing, magical, stupendous remainder of your day. Abby Navarro here, love, light, and a lot of abundance.